Good day, Great Tents. Welcome to this very first Skype lesson. Um, as you can see from the logo, this Skype lesson is brought to you by toenable.org. So if you miss anything in this lesson, or if you're not quite sure how you got here, if you just clicked a link on Facebook, feel free to go to www.toenable.org and or just toenable.org and find your way around. There is a video that explains how to get here and there are hundreds of other resources on the website as well and they're all free of charge. Right, so in this lesson we're going to be looking at algebraic expressions. I decided to start, since it's a revision lesson, on the beginning stuff, right at the beginning from the year. So we're going to start with alge algebraic expressions. So the first thing you need to understand is the real number system. Now that might seem a bit silly for you that you have to understand this, but you will find that it is important and it, is, it becomes more and more important as you go through grade 10 through to grade 11 through to grade 12 that you know the difference between rational and irrational numbers and the difference between integers and rational numbers and everything. So now I'm going to explain them to you. So. The natural numbers are basically your starting off numbers. So in other words, let's say for example, you were a caveman and you had to count rocks or stones. Your natural way of counting would be one, two, three, four, right? You've got one rock or two rocks or three rocks or whatever you're counting, okay? So the natural numbers start with one and they go up in whole numbers. That is your natural numbers. Your whole numbers, well, some poor caveman realized that if his rocks were stolen or whatever he had was stolen, then we, he would have zero, okay? He would have zero rocks. So the whole numbers, okay, are the natural numbers plus the number zero. So you can now have nothing. You can have zero as a placeholder as well. Then we got a little bit more intelligent as we we're going along and we realized that actually we could owe people things. So we could move into integers and we could talk about negative numbers. So your integers, your integers are basically numbers that go from minus infinity through to positive infinity. But we're still not quite as advanced as we are today. So we still only work in whole numbers. So we've got minus three or minus two or minus one or zero, or we've got one, two or three. Right, so those are your integers. And then we get to the next lot where we have rational numbers versus irrational numbers. And these are numbers that we are going to talk about specifically in this lesson. And then we're going to move on. And all of these together make up the real number system, the real number system, which is the number system that we look at when we look at the numbers on the Cartesian plane, your graphs and that. So when we're moving on to the Cartesian plane and the graphs, and we talk about a real number system, it's all the numbers in the system. So in this lesson, we're going to talk just about, let's just start with by looking at the rational numbers. So rational numbers are represented by the letter Q. Now, I know that some of you will have seen that Q has got little lines like this, okay, and it's supposed to look very special, but the whole point of this Q is that actually what happened was that when they started writing the letter Q on the board, they wanted to emphasize that it was a capital Q. So that is why they've got these double lines. So you know your real looks like that, and the normal, when your natural numbers look like that, well, that's actually just to emphasize that they're capital letters. Right, so the definition of a rational number is a number, any number that can be written as a fraction. So it can be written as a fraction where a and b are integers or whole numbers and b is not equal to naught. If b is equal to naught, we are dividing by zero and that is undefined. If you think about it, it's kind of crazy to divide by zero, okay? So what we're saying is a rational number is any number that can be written as a fraction where a and b are integers. So examples could be 10 over 1, which we know is 10, 21 over 7, well we know that 21 over 7 is actually 3, or minus 1 over minus 3, which is a third, 10 over 20, or minus 3 over 6. So basically it's anything, positive or negative, that can be written as a fraction, and that is your rational numbers. Now let's talk about rational numbers that can be written as decimals. 
The following types of decimals are rational. So decimal numbers that end, okay, so 0 0.8, because we know that 0 0.8 is equal to what? That's 8 tenths, or it's 80 hundredths, or it's 80 thousands, 800 thousands, and I can carry on with that forever and ever and ever, okay? So 0 0.8 is a decimal number that ends, and that is considered to be rational. Interestingly enough, decimals that have a single repeating digit are also considered to be rational. And the reason for this is if you take 6 divided by 10, 6 over 10, and you actually do the long division, or if you put in your calculator, you will get 0, 0.6666666 recurring. Okay, so if you have a recurring single repeating digit, a single repeating digit, then it is considered to be a rational number. Or if you have a pattern of multiple digits that are occurring, for example, 0, 27, 27, 27, 27, 27, 27, 27, then those are rational. Now, these are kind of strange, okay? But this is obvious, okay? But these numbers are rational. However, you get irrational numbers. Now, irrational numbers are basically not rational. So this little dash here means not. So Q means rational. So this means not rational, which means that it's irrational, which means that if rational means that you can write it as a fraction, you can write it as a fraction, then obviously irrational means you can't write it as a fraction. So irrational numbers are numbers that cannot be written as a fraction and with a numerator and a denominator as integers. Okay, cannot. So examples are the square root of 2, the square root of 3, the cube root of 4, pi, or something with 1 plus the third root of 5. Okay, another way of writing it saying square root is saying third. Okay, so those are all examples of irrational numbers. So let's talk about irrational numbers as decimals. If a decimal number continues without a repeated pattern of digits, then it's irrational number. So for example, pi is the most famous of all the irrational numbers because they've still not found a repeating pattern. Okay, they've been trying for years and years and years and years and they've not yet found a repeating pattern with pi. And in fact, there's a room in the Palais de la Couvert, which is in obviously in Paris, well it's not obviously in Paris, but it is in Paris, okay, and it's called the Pi Room, and it's at the university, and what they've done is they've written the digits of Pi uh, all the way around the room, and it's basically going on forever and ever, and that's what they're trying to show you, is that it just keeps going on forever and ever and ever. So those are your irrational numbers. So now I'm hoping that you know that rational numbers can be written as a fraction. Irrational numbers cannot be written as a fraction. Rational numbers can be decimals, okay, even if they're repeating. Irrational numbers, if we see them as decimals, it's because they are non-repeating. Now let's talk about rounding. So now that we've seen, spoken about decimals, we need to talk about rounding off numbers. So the first and easiest way to round off is to round off to one decimal place. And the rule is this. If the next digit is greater than five or equal to five, then you round up. Or if it is smaller than five, we round down, okay? So let us try this. Okay, your first example says, round five comma three, two, four to the nearest tenth, to the nearest tenth. So first of all, what we need to do is think about this and we need to look at it and decide what is the nearest tenth. Okay, here's the hint. I've told you in the heading that it's rounding to one decimal place, which means we're looking at the first number behind the comma. Okay, so if I write it here, I'm just going to write it big so we can do it 5, 3, 2, 4. We want to round this number off to this place here. So what you do is you look at the next digit. So we're going to be looking at this digit. And the rule is this. If this digit is bigger than 5 or equal to 5, we round this number up. 
to the next number. If this is smaller than five, we round down, which means we keep it to be the same. So in this case, two is definitely smaller than five. So therefore we round down and this becomes five comma three. Okay, let's look at this number. Now we've got one comma six four two. So we've got one comma six four two. And again, they want us to round off to the nearest tenth. So we're looking to round off to the first decimal place. Therefore, we have to look to the second number, the second number. Okay, so if we do that, we've got to look at our rule and our rule says if the next digit is greater than five or equal to five, we round up. If it's smaller than five, we round down. Okay, so let's look at four. Do you agree that four is smaller than five? Which means we're going to round down. So therefore this becomes one comma six. Okay, let me give you one more example just to make sure you understand this. Okay, I'm just going to erase this writing. Okay, let's say I want you to round off one comma uh, three, six, two, and I want you to round it to one decimal place. Okay, so again, when we're rounding, we're looking at this place here because this is the first decimal place, it's the first place after the comma. And when we do that, we always look to the next digit. So this is the next digit. And we can see that that is six, right? So is that smaller or bigger than five? Well, it's bigger which means we need to take this number here, the three, and round it up. So therefore it has to become one comma four. And there we go. Right, let's move on. Now we're rounding off to two decimal places. So again, if we're rounding off to two decimal places, it doesn't matter what place you're rounding off to, we always look at the next decimal place, okay? So yeah, we've got 3.43265, okay? 3.43265. We want to round off to two decimal places. So I'm looking at this. This is where my sum has to, my number has to end over here at 3.4 something. So what I do, I look at the next decimal place, which happens to be the third one in this case. And I look at it and I say, well, that's a two. Now the rule is, if it's smaller than five, we round down. If it's bigger than or equal to five, what do we do? We round up. Okay. So we look at this and we go three comma four, three, two. Two is obviously smaller than five, so we're gonna round down. So that becomes three comma four, three. Okay, let's move on. Now we've got six comma seven, eight, nine, six, four. Hmm. So now we're looking again at rounding the second decimal. So we look at the nine. Okay, the nine. So the nine is obviously bigger than five. So that means we're gonna round this number up to what? We're gonna round it up to nine. So this becomes six comma seven, nine. So let's look at a couple more examples. Now we want to round off. When it says 2DP, what are they talking about? They're talking about two decimal places. Okay. So we've got 0, 33333, which by the way, what is this? Is it rational or irrational? I'm really hoping that you're saying that it is rational because remember, if we have a repeating digit, it's a rational number. And they want us to round it off to two decimal places. So we're going for this. So what do we have to do? We have to look at the next decimal place, which is the third decimal place. Again, remember the rule. If it's smaller than five, we round down. If it's bigger than or equal to five, what do we do? We round up. Okay. So if we look at this, we've got 0, 0,33333. 3, 3, 3, 3. We don't worry about these. We're looking at the next number, only the next one. So this becomes 0, 3. Three. Why? Because this is smaller than five, so we're rounding down. Right, now again, one decimal place. So we're going to round off to this number here. Okay, 
So we've got 3, 345, 1352. We don't care about this. We don't, we only care about the one and the three, the one and the three. And the three is smaller than five again, which means we're rounding this off to stay at one. So it becomes three, four, five, comma, one. 8, 2, 3, 5, 7. And it says we're rounding off to three decimal places. So it's 2, 3, 5. We're rounding off to here. So what do we do? We look at the next number. Ah, but this next number is bigger than 5. So since it's bigger than 5, what do we do with this number? We round it up. So this becomes 8, 2, 3, 6. Right, next. Ooh, a nice question. They want us to round this off to two decimal places, but this is kind of a trick question. Okay, because rounding off to two decimal places pushes it through. So let's watch how it happens. So two decimal places is this. Okay, that's nine. So we have to look at the next number here. But do you see that this nine is bigger than five? So we have to round this nine up. But if we run this line up, what does it become? It becomes 10, or effectively a zero. But what does it do then? Then it rounds this number up to a zero, and we end up with 50. So this is a trick question, and they like asking these trick questions in tests and exams. Teachers love them. Okay, so they're not trying to trick you out, they're just trying to make sure you do understand everything. So what happens is, if you've got something like this, where you've got 9999, nine, 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 you've got to be very careful because this 9 here rounds this up to effectively 10, which then pushes this one up, which then in turn pushes that up to a 50. Right, so now you've learned about rounding. So if you remember, when, well, the reason we're doing this is because when we're talking about rational and irrational numbers, we spoke about decimals, okay? Now we're talking about thirds. And thirds are important because of the fact that they are also to do with rational and irrational numbers. Now, a third can either be a square root or a cube root or anything to do with like that, okay? So in other words, if I give you that, that is the square root of A. If I give you this, that's still the square root of A. But if I give you this, that's the cube root of A. If I give you this, it's the fourth root of A. Okay, so that's what we mean by thirds. Thirds are your roots. It's either square root, which is the same thing there. We don't generally write this one. Cube root or fourth root, etc., etc. Now, sometimes we get given a funny third that doesn't make sense. Okay, it's not a perfect square. If I said to you, what is the value of the square root of 16? You go, oh, that's really easy because 4 times 4 is 16. So the square root of 16 is 4, okay? Or if I said to you, what is the square root of 9? You'd be able to say, well, that's very easy. It's 3. But now I say to you, what between which two integers does the square root of 13 lie? What I'm really saying to you is what is the square root of 13 more or less, okay? And I'm trying to ask you if you know what the size of square root 13 is, but I can't say it like that. So I say to you, with, with, without using a calculator, can you tell me between which two integers the square root of 13 lies? So there's a method, okay? First of all, we're going to find an integer that is a perfect square that is smaller than 13. So let's think about what our perfect squares are. Okay, it's 1, 2 times 2 is 4, 3 times 3 is 9, and 4 times 4 is 16. So do you agree that these are your perfect squares that actually encompass the number 13? So there's an integer that is a perfect square that is smaller than 13 would be 9. Now we're going to look an integer that is bigger than 13. In this case, it's going to be 16, right? So now we're going to create an inequality. We're going to go 9 is smaller than 13, which is bigger than 
16. Perfectly true. Okay. So then what we say, sorry, well then it's pretty obvious then that if we square root every one of these, we can say the square root of 9 is smaller than the square root of 13, which is smaller than the square root of 16, right? But what is the square root of 9? Well, the square root of 9, we've already said, is 3. Okay. Then we've got the square root of 13, because we don't know what that is, because it's a funny square root. And then we've got the square root of 16, which is 4. So do you agree that the square root of 13 lies between the two integers, 3 and 4? So if I said to you, what is the square root of 13? You'd go, mm, it's about three and a something, three and a quarter, three and a half. You don't know. You know that it lies between three and four. Okay, so remember these steps because now we're going to practice. So those are the rest of my steps that I've just shown you. So when you're going through this video again, you'll be able to go through these steps where it says we're going to square root all the integers, just like I've shown you. And then finally, you solve it, okay? So those are just the last two steps that I've written out now for you. So now let's do an example. We're looking at the square root of 27. So remember, what are the steps? The steps are first to find the square root that is smaller than 27 and find the square root that is, I mean, the square that is bigger than 27. So let's think about our squares again. One times one is one. Two times two is four. 3 times 3 is 9, 4 times 4 is 16, 5 times 5 is 25, and 6 times 6 is 36. So do you agree that we're looking at these two numbers, 25 and 36? They are smaller than and bigger than 27. So I could make an inequality that says 27 is bigger than 25, but it's smaller than 36, right? And that's perfectly true. Then what I could do is I could square root every single number in this expression. The reason I can do that is because I'm doing the same thing to every one of the values in the expression. So I'm going to square root the 25, which means that that is smaller than the square root of 27, which in turn is smaller than the square root of 36. Okay, what is the square root of 25? Well, that's 5, which in turn is still smaller than the square root of 27, which in turn is smaller than the square root of 36, but what is the square root of 36? It is 6. So therefore, we can say that 27 lies between the integers 5 and 6. Okay, the square root of 27 lies between five and six. Okay, let's do another example. Oh, now we've got cube roots. We've got a cube root of 54. So now we're going to do exactly the same method, except this time, instead of using squares, we're going to use cubes. So let's do this nice and slowly. Remember, you're not supposed to use a calculator with these questions. So one times one times one is one. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. 3 times 3 times 3 is 27. 4 times 4 times 4 equals what? 4 times 4 is 16 times by 4. four it becomes 64. Ooh, okay. So now we've got this perfect cube is 27. That perfect cube is 64, and 54 falls between 27 and 64. So this means what? This means our expression is going to be this. It's going to be, right, that 54 is smaller than 64, but bigger than 27, right? And now we do exactly the same thing as we did before, except that instead of cube rooting, we're going to square, I mean, instead of square rooting, we're going to cube root. Okay, so we're going to cube root 27, then we're going to cube root 54, and then we're going to cube root 64. Okay, right, so the cube root of 27 we know is 3. 
We don't know what the cube root of 54 is. That's the whole point. The point is we're trying to find out where this fits. Is smaller than the cube root of 64, and the cube root of 64 is 4. So therefore, we can say that the cube root of 54 is between the integers 3 and 4. Right, I hope that you understand what I've been doing here. And remember, grade 10, so there are lots more examples like this on the Turnable system. So if you get stuck with this, remember to come and watch the video again. You can just go back to the live session and go watch the video again once it's finished. Just give it a few minutes to upload if you go and look through it back immediately. Okay, and watch the video again and then go do the questions in the Turnable system. There are lots of them there. Right, now we need to be talking about monomials, binomials, and trinomials. Now remember that this is a revision lesson, which is why I'm moving quite quickly through the work. Okay, so we need to make sure that you understand all this, and this is right from the beginning of the year, and we're already in July. So I'm going to be going through this basic stuff quite quickly, and then when we get to the more complicated stuff, then I will move more slowly. Right, so let's talk about monomials, binomials, and trinomials. So if you have a mathematical expression, a mathematical expression is anything where you've got something that can be added or subtracted or divided or whatever, right? If the expression has only one value, then we say it's a monomial. Mon means one, okay? So if there's only one value in the mathematical expression, then it is called a monomial. A binomial, bi means two. Think bicycle. A bicycle's got two wheels. This means two. So in other words, if you have any expression that is separated by a plus or minus, plus or a minus, and it has two variables or numbers, then we have a binomial. Trinomials, again, what do you think tri means? Tri means three. Think like tricycle. Okay, so this is going to be a mathematical expression which has got three, three things in it, okay? So it could have, and it doesn't, as long as it's separated, remember mathematical expression, mathematical expression, the variables have to be separated by a plus or a minus, okay? Because divide or times makes it into one, one variable. So we're looking at it's being separated by plus or a minus. So now what we're going to be doing, and this you guys should know from grade eight and grade nine, okay? So you should be able to add them and subtract them. I'm really hoping you do because we're moving on to multiplying them. So what we're going to be doing is looking at multiplying a monomial with a polynomial. So we didn't talk about polynomials in the last slide. Let's talk about it now. Poly really means lots, lots or many. Okay, poly means lots or many. So this is a monomial, which is a, a mathematical expression with a single value, and we are multiplying it by polynomials. So basically, we, as far as math is concerned, is three or more. Okay, three or more is considered a polynomial. If you've got three or more variables within a mathematical expression. Okay, so the law that we're going to use is the distributive law. Okay, the distributive law. So what we're doing is we're looking at multiplying this across. So we're going to be multiplying this first bit here with that bit, then we're going to multiply it with the second one, and then we're going to multiply with the third one. Right, so let's do that, and I'm going to do it nice and slowly to make sure you understand. So we're going to go 2x times by 3x. That's your first with your first, right? Then we're going to add that, and then we're going to multiply 2x times by, and you always bring the sign that's in front of the variable with it, because that sign belongs to that variable. So it becomes minus 2xy plus, and then we go again, 
2x times by 4y, okay? And I'm going to put a little cross here instead. Please note that there's a difference between x and times. So this is x, that's times. Now, you guys don't have to write this out like this. This is a very long way to write it out. I'm writing it out like this in baby steps because I want to make sure you guys know exactly what we're doing here, okay? Obviously, as you get better at these questions, you can just cruise along and go, well, we know that 2x times 3x is 2 times 3 is 6, and x times x is x squared, so you could have just written that, okay? Plus, 2 times 2 is 4, x times x is x squared, and that's y. But note that I've forgotten something. I actually haven't. I just wanted to remind you of it. A plus times a minus is a minus. So I'm going to put a bracket around that and put the minus in there. Plus, okay, 2 times 4 is 8, and x times y is xy. Right, so now I want to write this out nicely, and the way I'm going to do that is to make sure that these brackets go away. So that becomes 6x squared minus 4x squared y plus 8xy. And now if I wanted to make sure if I was finished or not, I'd look for common factors. Okay, but this is just 6x squared, that's minus 4x squared y, and that's plus 8xy. So there are no common factors, all these terms are different. So I leave the question just as it is. Now let's look at this one. Woo, that's a long one, okay? We've got x multiplied by x squared minus 2xy plus 3y squared minus 2y times by x squared minus 2xy plus 3y squared. Okay, so again, I'm going to do this in baby steps. I'm going to do it nice and slowly so that you can make sure that you understand what we are doing, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is multiply out this first bracket. So we're going to go x times x squared. And this time I'm using a dot instead of a times just to make it make sure that you understand what I'm doing. Then I've got plus x times minus 2xy plus there's x times 3y squared. There's that. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is this is a minus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go plus bracket, big bracket. And the reason for that is because I want to take in effect this minus. If I don't do that, I could make some silly mistakes. Okay. So let's do that like this. So whenever you see a minus, especially if it's outside the bracket like this, I would separate it out and put it in a big bracket. Otherwise, you might forget to multiply it through and then your whole sum is wrong. Okay, so this becomes minus 2y times by x squared in brackets plus, here we go again, minus 2y times by minus 2xy. That's multiplying with this. And then finally, oh dear, I didn't write small enough. We've got minus 2y times by 3y squared. And then close the bracket. Okay, so now let's neaten this up. Let's multiply it out. So x times x squared is x cubed. Okay, plus bracket. Plus times a minus is a minus. x times, okay, 2 just stays. x times x is x squared and there's your y, plus nothing here is similar, so it just becomes 3xy squared, and you didn't need the bracket, I'm just leaving it in, plus big bracket, okay? x squared times our minus 2y just becomes minus 2x squared y, and why did I rearrange these letters? Because generally you put your variables in alphabetical order. It's not a big deal if you'd written it as 2yx squared. It just is neater and it helps us identify common factors if you always keep them in alphabetical order. Okay. Plus, a minus times a minus is a plus. Okay. So we can ignore that. 2 times 2 is 4x and then y times y is y squared. Plus, bracket, a minus times a plus is a minus, 2 times 3 is 6, and y times y squared is y cubed, close the bracket. 
Okay, so let's do this. We've got x cubed minus times the plus is minus 2x squared y plus 3x squared y plus times the minus is a minus 2x squared y plus 4xy squared plus times a minus is a minus minus 6y cubed. And now we look to see if we've got any common factors. So there is an x cubed and there's no other x cubed, so we leave it alone, it's x cubed. There's minus 2x squared y, and here's another, and then it's plus, I've made a mistake, that's squared over there. Minus 2x squared y over there, so that becomes minus 4x squared y, okay? Then you've got plus 3xy squared, plus 4xy squared, which it becomes plus 7xy squared, and then it becomes minus 6y cubed. Okay, so beyond applying the distributive law, the trick with these is to be very careful and to make sure you don't make silly mistakes because the easiest thing to do is to make a silly mistake like I did here and then get the sum wrong. So you have to be very careful when they do these sums. Right, let's move on. Now we're looking at multiplying a binomial with a binomial. In other words, we're looking at a bracket, which has got two things, okay? A block plus a triangle multiplied with a circle plus, I don't know, a funny shaped thing, okay? That's what we're looking at. So let's look at at our first example and again we're going to use the distributive law which means that everything in this bracket is going to be multiplied with everything in that bracket okay so let's start first with first i'm sure you guys have heard of foil if you haven't it's first then it's outers then it's inners and then it's last foil Okay, and that is the order that we multiply these in. So it's first, outers, inners, last. Okay, so the first of the first is x times x is x squared. So we go x times x is x squared plus bracket. Then it's outers. So it's, this one is an outer and this one with the minus 3 is an outer. So it's x times by minus 3. Then it's the inners. And I'm going to change color. The inners of these dudes here. So it becomes plus 2 times x. And then finally the last, and again I'm going to change color, which is going to be the 2 times by the minus 3. Remember that, okay? Plus 2 times by minus 3. Okay, so let's bring this all together. So we've got x squared plus bracket x times minus 3 is minus 3x plus 2x 2 times x is 2x plus bracket 2 times minus 3 is minus 6. Now again I've just been extra careful in that every time I saw a minus in either of the numbers or variables that I have put brackets around it so that I could make sure I multiply this out correctly. Okay so then we've got x squared plus times a minus is a minus, it's minus 3x, plus 2x, and a plus times a minus is minus 6. So then what do we do to finish this off? What do we always do? We always look for common variables or common factors, and we can see that this is a 3x and that's a 2x. So we can add these like terms, so we've got x squared, Minus 3x plus 2x is minus x minus 6. Right. Let's look at another example. Okay, I've written over it, so I'm just going to erase all the writing. Okay, and I'm going to change the color of this pen because I really don't like it. All right, let's do this. So again, we're going to apply foil. Foil. First, Outers, you can tell I'm not very good at writing downwards. Inners and last. 
Okay, first out is in is last. Okay, so first is 4x multiplied by 2x. So it's 4x multiplied by 2x plus the last 4x multiplied by 2. So it's 4x multiplied by 2 plus the inners, which are these two, 3 multiplied by 2x plus the last, which is 3 multiplied by 2. And again, grade 10s, you don't have to write this out like this if you are confident and you know how to do these nice and easily. Okay, but if you are finding that you're making silly mistakes when you do this and you don't know what you're doing wrong when you find out you didn't get it right, do it slowly, do it step for step, okay? It's silly to rush through these sums, okay? So four times four, two is eight. X times X is X squared, plus four times two is eight X, plus three times two is six X, plus three times two is six. And then we look for our like terms and we see that eight X and six X have got the same variables, they're just X. So we can add them and you end up with eight X squared, plus 14x plus 6. Okay, not too bad, hey? Right, let's try a binomial times a trinomial. Okay, so it's obviously then a two-variable expression multiplied by three-variable expression. And we're going to use, again, the distributive law, and we go, go through it basically, nice and slowly, okay? So we're gonna go first multiplied by the first, which is x times by x squared, plus first multiplied by the second, x times by two x, plus x times by three, okay? Now we move on to the second part. So it's going to be one times by x squared. So it's one times by x squared, okay? Plus, sorry, I'm laughing because I really shouldn't have written that down. I mean, 1 times x squared is just x squared. Then 1 times 2x is obviously just going to be 2x. Plus 1 times 3 is just going to be 3. We got away with pretty easy stuff on that side. So x times x squared is x cubed plus x times 2 x times 2x is going to be 2x squared plus x times 3 is 3x plus x squared plus 2x plus 3. And now what do we do? As always, we look for like terms. So here's an x cubed and there's nothing else that's cubed. So this is just x cubed. Plus we've got 2x squared and x squared. So 2x squared plus x squared is going to obviously give you 3x squared. I don't know what I was thinking, because there's an implied one year. Remember that grade tens? If you don't have a number in front of a variable, then it implies that it's one. So we've got 2x squared plus 1x squared is 3x squared. Then we've got 3x plus 2x. So 3x plus 2x is 5x plus 3. There we go. So that is a binomial times a trinomial. Okay. Now, the next one is a little bit more complicated. It has got two variables. Please note, there is an X and a Y, okay? So we're gonna do exactly the same thing, but we're gonna multiply across, okay? But please be careful now because we've got both X's and Y's. So, in fact, unfortunately, I've run out of time. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna leave this up. And if you guys want to, you can watch the video again and or just, I will pause this and you can write it down and try it for the next lesson, which is on Wednesday at the same time. And I will start from here again and we will go through this binomial times English with the trinomial with two variables. Right, I hope that you've learned a lot in this lesson. Please, if you don't understand anything or if you missed anything in this lesson, go back to the toenable.org website, go back and look at this live view television broadcast. It obviously won't be live anymore. And then all you do is you click on the show and it will show you the recording of it. Okay, please have a great day and come back on Wednesday. Cheers.